The title of our sermon this morning is Dragging Judas into the Light. Dragging Judas into the Light. This is part two. So we've been working in this text, John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30. And we're working verse by verse through this section of Scripture. We're working verse by verse through the Gospel of John. And we've come to John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30, where we see in this text the example, uh, the terrible, infamous example of Judas. Now, last Lord's Day, we discussed the setting for our text, right? It's Thursday evening. The disciples are eating the Passover meal together. And there is a wicked traitor in their midst. Jesus said, behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And by the end of our text in verse 30, Judas slithers off into the night, swallowed up by the darkness. Now, our concern in this study, as we've been working through these verses, has been to drag Judas, as it were, back into the light, to shed light, the light of God's word, on what Judas has done here, to shed light on how his actions fit within the plans and purposes of God, and to see how even the despicable and detestable actions of a backstabbing betrayer served to bear witness to the true light that has come into the world that all through him might believe. As we come back together in the study of our passage this morning, John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30, I'm hoping with the Lord's help to accomplish three purposes for us this morning. One, we're going to consider the big picture. We want to consider the big picture. Based on our context from this passage, how should we understand and apply what we've studied so far in verses 18 through 21? So I want to consider with us the big picture and make sure that we don't lose sight of that. Secondly, I want to consider the lessons that we can learn from the response of the disciples in verses 22 through 26. And then thirdly, I want us to consider the lessons that we can learn from the actions of Judas himself in verses 27 through 30. We're going to look at the big picture we're going to look at the response of the disciples, and we're going to look at the actions of Judas and glean lessons from those, all right? So let's begin first, and let's take a look at the big picture. There's so much gracious instruction from the Lord here, right? These passages are packed with truth. There's warning, there's encouragement, there's comfort, there's rebuke, there's instruction. And as we consider those things, and as we consider these lessons, I don't want us to lose sight of the very important and primary emphasis that is discussed in this text. We need to see and digest the big picture, if you will, and live in light of the truth that we learn here. And to do that, I want to give you a line of reasoning from the text, and I want us to grasp this, okay? I want us to understand it. We're going to build our understanding of the lessons to be learned here, point by point, block by block. The first point is this. The first point is this, and we alluded to this last week. We will face great difficulty in the Christian life, right? Very obvious point from the text. We will face great difficulty in the Christian life. Paul said this in Acts 14. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul said in Romans 8. We are heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ if, conditional word there, if indeed we suffer with him. Now here in John 13, the disciples are facing the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ and that betrayal that will lead the Lord Jesus Christ to his suffering and to his crucifixion. Look with me beginning at verse 18. John chapter 13, beginning in verse 18. The Lord says, I don't speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, the Lord says, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. And he testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now think about the condition, the state, the circumstances in which the disciples find themselves. They have given everything to follow Christ, right? And in just a few short hours, 
it's going to appear to them that all of it, all of it is coming unraveled at the seams around them, right? First, there's the betrayal of Judas, right? That betrayal leads to the cross. Beyond the cross lies the preaching of the cross and great persecution. And beyond the persecution for each of these disciples is a martyr's death. They're going to face anxiety. They're going to face doubts, fear, confusion, despair, hardship. Paul said of his difficulty, he said, we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. In 2 Corinthians 9, he said, we felt that we had received even the sentence of death. The Christian life is hard. Can God's people say amen? Amen. There are a lot of professing Christians that wouldn't understand this, wouldn't know to say amen. But if you're a true disciple, a genuine disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know the Christian life is hard. There is difficulty associated with living this life. It is not easy. You're going to face great difficulty in the Christian life. And that's going to come in various forms, all right? We have one example of one form here given to us in John chapter 13. In, in Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, uh, the main character, Christian, he comes to the cross, right? And if you remember this part of the story, as he comes to the cross, the great burden of sin on his back falls from off his shoulders, falls from off his back, it's loose from him, and Christian, that burden is dropped at the cross. As he went on his way, Christian next came to a hill called Difficulty. You remember that from the story? The hill called Difficulty. It's a picture of the Christian li- of the Christian life. A hill called Difficulty. Listen to what Christian said. Christian said, "The hill, though high, I covet to ascend. The difficulty will not me offend, for I perceive the way to life lies here." Come, Christian says, pluck up heart. Let's neither faint nor fear. Better, though difficult, the right way to go than wrong, though easy, where the end is woe. You had better count the cost of following Christ. Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. But listen, that difficult way leads to life. It leads to life. Better, though difficult, the right way to go than wrong, though easy, where the end is woe. We will face great difficulty in the Christian life. So secondly, as we build our argument from the text, the Lord himself graciously prepares us to face that difficulty. The Lord prepares us. Now that is essentially what the Lord is doing here for his disciples in John chapter 13. He's preparing them to face the trials that are coming. So the first way that he does that in John chapter 13 is by reassuring them of his love for them. Now as he does that for his disciples, he's doing that for you and I, all right? In John chapter 13, in verses 1 through 17, he's reassuring you and I of the love that he has for us also. In John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30, This betrayal of the Lord is wreaking havoc, right? Wreaking havoc. That havoc-wreaking betrayal of the Lord is set in the context of John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and the Lord's immeasurable love for his own. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Verse 1 says, Before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And that should reassure your heart. Amen? He loved them to the end of himself, right? To the extent even of the cross pictured here in the humble self-sacrifice of stooping to wash their feet. Look at verse 12. Verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, he sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Jesus is saying, listen, this is love. This is love. Humility, self-sacrifice, laying down your life for your friends. This is just a, a humble, small picture, an argument from the lesser to the far greater 
the foreshadowing of the kind of love with which the Lord loved us at the cross. You are loved by God with an immeasurable, infinite, eternal, unchangeable love. And you need to be convinced of that in facing difficulty. All right? We're going to face great difficulty, but the Lord graciously prepares us to face it by reassuring us of his great love for us. So when that trial comes, and it will, right? When the battle with sin is raging, and it will, when we are burdened beyond measure sometimes with Paul, above strength, despairing even of life, God's people can believe and can trust and can be comforted by the fact that we are deeply loved by God. Isn't that a comfort to your heart and encouragement to you in difficulty? We need that. You need to be reassured by that. When you're battling sin, you need to be reassured by that. The second way that the Lord graciously prepares us to face that difficulty, according to John 13, the second way in which he does that is by reminding us that he has ordained it. He has ordained it. There are many ways in which the Lord provides comfort for his people in suffering. One way is to remember that Christ also suffered. Amen? Hebrews says, to consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Another way is to consider the Lord's conduct in his suffering. Peter says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. One of the most precious truths for the Christian to understand and to take to heart in the midst of great difficulty is that the same Lord who so deeply loves his own, even to the end of his own life, that same Lord Jesus Christ also in love ordained the very trial that you're going through. He ordained it. He brought it about. He has ordained that we will suffer in him. He's not forsaken us. This is not defeat. It's not failure or abandonment or condemnation. This is the plan of God, the purposes of God. You in Christ will suffer. This is love. This is one of the ways in which the Lord, in love, loves and cares for his own. You will face difficulty in the Christian life. Now, Jesus does this for his disciples in John chapter 13 by showing them in this text that Judas was not a mistake. Judas is not a mistake. Judas is not a defeat. Judas is just another part of the plan. Look at verse 18. Verse 18, the Lord says, I do not speak concerning all of you. Listen, I know whom I have chosen, and he has chosen Judas. But that the scripture may be fulfilled... He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now, all of this is happening because it was planned to happen. This is the fulfillment of Psalm 41. You're going to face great difficulty in the Christian life. God is gracious to provide for you and to prepare you to face that great difficulty. One way is by reassuring you of his love for you. But the other way here specifically is by showing you that he has ordained it all for your good. This was foretold. This was planned. Look at verse 19. He says, I tell you, before it comes, so that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. In other words, I'm going to tell you the future. Right? I'm going to tell you the future. I'm going to show you that I am sovereign over all these things, so that when everything happens exactly as I told you that it would, you will trust in me and believe in me in the trial that you're in and persevere through that works together and we're to think that way when we face difficulty you don't want you know the idea that someone would be angry with God is absurd God is sovereign and if you believe God he works together all things for the good of those who love him and are the called according to his purpose we're to trust him and he gives us every evidence to trust him every reason to trust him every reason to persevere through the trial it should bring great comfort to the Christian to know that the Lord is sovereign here over choo choosing Judas. 
It should bring great comfort to the Christian to know that the Lord is sovereign over redemptive history, fulfilling here even Scripture, fulfilling the Old Testament Scriptures, right? He's sovereign even over the wicked betrayal that led to the cross. And he's sovereign over every trial and every difficulty that you're going to face also. You see? We therefore can trust him. We can believe him. Take him at his word that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, this text and others like it are given to comfort the disciples. These things should comfort genuine Christians. I want you to turn. I want to give you another example of this. Turn with me to John 15. Just a page to the right. To John chapter 15. Let me give you another example of this very thing. John chapter 13, the Lord is saying, look, I am sovereign over these things. All of these things happen according to plan. That display, that demonstration of his sovereignty to the disciples happens frequently through the Gospel of John. Here's another example of it in John chapter 15. Look down beginning at verse 18. Look at verse 18. Take this to heart, right? I want to live according to this truth. This should embolden us to live for Christ despite the difficulty. Verse 18 says this. The Lord says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's a statement of fact. You go anyway. If you witness all Christians witness. If you witness, you know the world hates you. Get in one argument with some kid at the campus, right? You know the world hates Christianity. You see it on the news every day. You see it in the papers every day. The world hates Christianity. And that hatred is becoming more and more brazenly obvious with every passing day. Here, in other words, he says, remember, look at verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you. I said this in John chapter 13, verse 16, the text that we're studying, okay? Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. In other words, disciples, don't be surprised by the difficulty that you're about to face. Their difficulty is just getting started, right? They're going to face great persecution, But that persecution, that difficulty, has been ordained. The Lord here says that it will be so. This is all according to plan. He says the same thing for you and I. This doesn't apply to just these 11 men, minus Judas. This applies to all of you and I together. We will face this difficulty. We're going to face persecution. Look at verse 21. But all these things they will do to you, for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now, because he has spoken to them, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now, They have seen and also hated both me and my father. And if they hate him, hate his father, they hate you and I, right? They hate those who are in Christ. The Lord here in John chapter 15 attributes to the world a blind and willful hatred for Christ and a blind and willful hatred for his disciples. The world is guilty. There's absolutely no excuse for that whatsoever. It has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. However, disciples, this terrible reality that we look at in John chapter 15 that the Lord is describing here is far from indicating a defeat. It's far from saying that the plans have come unraveled. Far from saying that God's purposes are undermined and circumstances are out of control. The reason that's not the case is because all of this, Jesus says, is taking place exactly in accord with what the scriptures have said. God is sovereign over all these things. Look at verse 25. But this happened, right? This hatred, this persecution, this difficulty you're going to face, this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. 
Now, this is to encourage the disciples. When the disciples went out and for the cause of Christ suffered, eventually they suffered to the point of death. When they went out under that persecution, it was comforting to them to know that it was all according to the redemptive plan of God. This was happening to them according to God's word. That should comfort you and I, brother and sister, also. It needs to comfort us. We need to take comfort in that. The persecution, the difficulty that you face is according to the plan and will of God. Flip the page, another couple of pages to the right, and look at John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And look there, beginning at verse 23. Another example of this very thing, right? Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top from the top in one piece. Verse 24. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be? Now, did they do this? Did, did John record this because it was just an interesting story? Just some interesting facts associated with the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ that he thought we might want to know. No, he does this with a purpose, right? He records these things with a purpose. What's the purpose? Look at verse 24, about halfway through. The purpose is, so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Do you see? Look down at verse 28. Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. They filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now the primary reason, these things are revealed in this way in Scripture, the primary reason is to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? To magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the promised Old Testament prophesied Messiah. He is the promised deliverer, the sent one of God. And in that, it magnifies who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what the Lord Jesus Christ has come to do. But this also has the added effect, and the Lord Jesus uses it in this way, it has the added effect of being a great encouragement to believers. So all of these things take place according to plan. There have been many. I know you've experienced this, I have, in talking to someone who has set out to follow the Lord, right? They say, I want to follow the Lord. In the beginning, they would charge hell with a squirt gun, right? And a year later, they're waxing and waning, right? They're, they're in danger. They're facing threats on every side to their profession of faith, and they're tempted to leave the Lord. How many times have they just had these conversations where someone would say that this is just not what it's supposed to be? This Christianity thing is not working, right? I'm having difficulty over my sin. The Lord has said you will face difficulty. You will suffer. You're going to face trials. You're to be embattled in the cause of Christ. Inward battles, battles from without. You are to wage holy warfare, and it's not going to be easy. And think about those in the first century. To, the, to those in the first century who faced the reality of the cross, the faith-shaking reality of seeing the Lord Jesus Christ crucified, and themselves then needing to know that their faith in the Lord is well-placed. They don't have the rest of the New Testament yet. They don't have the progress of revelation like we do. They need to be reassured. This was all according to the salvation plan of God. Far from God merely reacting to a, a situation gone horribly wrong and turning it for good, what has happened is the appearance into history of this part of God's redemptive plan and a history that was eternally decided, decided in the counsels and purposes of God from before the foundation of the world. So follow the, the flow of reasoning with me. One, we're going to face great difficulty in the Christian life. We're going to face great difficulty in the Christian life. Two, God graciously prepares his own 
to face that difficulty. Three, so that, so that you and I, brothers and sisters, we don't depart from him in the face of difficulty. So that we don't depart from him in the face of difficulty. So that you and I persevere to the end and are saved. Now specifically in John chapter 13, that we would not depart from him in the face of difficulty is associated here with serving him in the gospel. Serving him in the gospel. Now here's the reality. When we enter into the love and grace and mercy of God in Christ through repentant faith, we also enter into God's purpose and God's mission in the world. Now that's the way that it is, folks. When you enter into the love and grace and mercy of God in the gospel, in Christ, at the very same time, you are entering into God's purpose and God's mission in the world. Now what is that? To spread the gospel to seek and to save that which is lost. When you enter in, when you are united to Christ by repentant faith, you enter into God's purpose and God's mission in this world. That's to spread the message of the gospel of salvation in His Son in the face of opposition and hostility. That's what you have been called to. When you enter in, you are entering into that purpose, that mission. Look at chapter 13 and look at verse 20. Back in John chapter 13, look at verse 20. Most assuredly, the Lord says, I say to you, he who receives whoever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now he says to the disciples here in verse 20, I don't want you to doubt. I don't want you to doubt. I am sending you, and there will be rejection." Your commission in the gospel, your being united to me in the cause of Christ to go out into the world and to seek and to save that which is lost will not be undermined or hindered by this rejection. In the face of Judas, the opposite implication is obvious. Whoever rejects you, right, he's saying to them, whoever rejects you is rejecting both me and God the Father who sent me. However, don't cave in under that rejection. Don't cave in. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't despair. You have entered into my love, and as entering into my love, I have sent you with a mission now as an emissary to accomplish my purposes, the Lord is saying. Remember, the Lord is saying, that I am sovereign over all these things. I know whom I have chosen, and therefore, whomever receives me, receives him who sent me. Whoever receives you, receives me, and God stands behind both of them. Whoever receives you receives me, and God the Father receives them also. Now let's consider the, the big picture then of what the Lord is teaching in John chapter 13. Let's put it all together, okay? It should be of great encouragement to the Christian along his very difficult journey to the celestial city that God both deeply loves us and has revealed himself to us in his word in order to build our faith in him, that we would believe, that we would trust him, okay? As sovereign over all things, he's worthy to be trusted. He is worthy to be faithfully followed, even if it means giving up our own life to do it. When we are betrayed, and we will be, we can take comfort in the fellowship we have with the Lord who suffered far beyond anything we're going to face. We can take comfort in that fellowship with him. And we should be motivated to persevere in the mission and purpose of God knowing those things. We need to be motivated by that to persevere in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said this. Paul said, blessed be God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may, may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now that's a mouthful, but that's a glorious mouthful. Amen? We are to be comforted by God, enter into his consolation, so that with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God, we can comfort others. Okay? Verse 5. For as 
the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. That's just that's an awesome thought, right? You face tremendous difficulty in the Christian life, rejection, persecution, suffering, battles on the right, battles on the left, battles within, battles without. You're battling all the time. You can get weary, you can get discouraged. But listen, as those sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation abounds. Not just out of thin air, right? Not apart from Christ, but our consolation abounds through Christ. He is our consolation. He's to be our comfort. He's to be our strength. Verse 6, now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. I, I love the scriptures that say, uh, you know, Elijah was a man with a, with a nature like ours, right? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Well, Paul, Paul was a, nature, was a man with a nature like ours. And the same grace that is effective in Paul for enduring the same sufferings that same grace is effective in me, is effective in you if you're in Christ, to help you through suffering, to help you face difficulty. We have the same grace afforded to us. Our hope, Paul says in you, is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation, the glorious blessing. One commentator said this, he said it should be of great encouragement to the Christian that God knows the instruction and the consolation and the direction that we need on our journey to heaven. Elevating his thoughts and desires of that happiness, right, the happiness of heaven, and strengthening him against all opposition in the way, both that of corruption within and temptation and afflictions from without. That's the grace. Christ purchased for us at the cross to face difficulty. Now listen, all of that is a laboring in the Lord, laboring in God's purpose, laboring in God's mission, laboring as the Lord has called us to do in our own sanctification, laboring for holiness, striving toward godliness, exercising ourselves toward godliness, all that we are to do. If you profess to live the Christian life, and yet you know nothing of this kind of battle, right? This kind of war, you need to examine yourself. You're living a hypocrite, a, a counterfeit Christian so-called existence. The Christian life is going to be a battle. But God prepares you for the battle. God comforts you in the battle. God strengthens you in the battle. God provides grace in the battle. This is an awesome salvation that we've been delivered to. I remember... Um, watching a while back uh, a documentary uh, about a tightrope walker, right? A tightrope walker. And if you, look, if you ever look at how a tightrope walker learns to walk the tightrope, right? Does he start off 30 stories up? No, he starts off three feet off the ground. <laughs> so he starts off low, strings a cable, he puts it down near the ground. Now me, three foot off the ground, if I fell from that, I'd probably break my hip. But a tightrope walker, three feet off the ground, comforted, knowing that the ground is right underneath him, and that's how they learn. They train three feet off the ground. So think about it for a moment. What's the difference between if you can walk a tightrope three feet off the ground and walking a tightrope 30 stories off the ground? Same tightrope, but everything's different, right? Everything, because if you fall, it means death, right? There are winds and gusts up there. There's anxiety. There's fear. There's a rush of adrenaline that you have to deal with. But all this, everything changes. Everything changes. You have to gain confidence, the tightrope walker does, gain confidence at a lower height in order to be able to walk at a higher height. Listen, for the Christian, as the Lord teaches us through trial, teaches us and matures us through difficulty, right? as he bolsters our faith by his spirit through the word, for the Christian, knowing and believing and trusting in the promises of God, it is like every trial you face, every difficulty, every gust of wind, 
is like walking a 10 foot wide painted line on a granite slab. There is no fear of falling. There is no fear of death. There is no fear if you believe and trust in the promises of God to the Christian. He has assured you of his great love for you. Right? He has assured you of the, the immeasurable, infinite, immutable way in which he loves you, most magnificently and gloriously displayed at the cross where he purchased your salvation, so that then, knowing that he is sovereign over all things, providing for us in this way, that you can walk through difficulty, walk through trial, face any op opposition, knowing that God the Father has ordained all these things for your good. It's, it's in the flesh, isn't it? It's in the flesh that we fail to trust. It's in the flesh that we don't believe him and take him at his word. We doubt. The Lord is good. The Lord is gracious. We have to live in light of that truth. We're going to face difficulty, and the difficulties are going to get harder and harder. We see it, don't, don't we? And listen, part of the Christian life is putting yourself in the face of those difficulties. In other words, what I mean by that is that you can sit back and be a, a silent, concealed, nobody knows it kind of quote unquote Christian. All you have to do is keep quiet. You don't have to just don't open your mouth. Don't open your mouth, and you're not gonna battle. You're not gonna face persecution. Don't open your mouth. But as soon as you open your mouth, you're going to face difficulty. You're going to face persecution. All who desire to live godly in this present age. And notice how Paul, to Timothy there, describes godliness. He implies from the text, if you desire to live godly, it's going to bring, bring upon you persecution. You need to put yourself into the battle. Put yourself into the battle. It is a step of faith. It's a step of faith to put yourself into the battle for Christ. Put yourself into the battle. Wage war. Go out with the gospel. Out with his purpose. Out with his mission. That's what he's called the disciples here to in John 13. They're going out with his purpose and his mission. They're going to face difficulty. When you go out in his purpose and in his mission, you're going to face difficulty. And all of that, brothers and sisters, all of that is a fulfillment of Scripture. It's a fulfillment of what God has already said. Let's pick up the, the flow of the text now in verse 22. That's the big picture, right? That's the big picture. That's how we're to understand what's going on here in John chapter 13 and how we're to live in light of that. And we see their context in which they are battling. We need to battle in the same way and trust the Lord. So now we pick up back with the flow of the text in verse 22. Beginning in verse 22, there are several lessons that we can learn. There are several lessons that we can learn from the response of the disciples there are several lessons that we can learn from the actions of Judas. So if you're walking along the clothesline of our text, right? If you're walking along the line of our text, you want to pull each lesson out of the basket like a clean sheet, and you want to pin it to your line. And these are each lessons that we can learn from our text. First, let's consider the lessons that we can learn and apply from the response of the disciples. The response of the disciples. In verse 21, the Lord is terrasso, he's troubled. He's stirred up. He's deeply disturbed in his spirit. And he solemnly announces in verse 21 that one of these men who have been together with him for the last three years is going to betray him. Right? I want you to notice first the degree to which hypocrisy can hide. The degree to which hypocrisy can hide. Look at verse 22. When the Lord announced this, the disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. And that word there, perplexed, means that they were at a loss. They were filled with confusion. There was stunned silence, if you can imagine, at the table. <laughs> like, who is this that he's talking about? They were looking around at each other in disbelief. But it says in verse 21, 23, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, the disciple whom Jesus loved is a reference to John one who wrote this gospel. It's a great title, isn't it? If you want to refer to yourself, that's a great way to refer to yourself. And it's not prideful. It's not prideful for John to do that. In fact, it's precisely the opposite. If you consider what we already looked at in John chapter 13, verse 1, 
that he loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. That is a miraculous love, isn't it? And one of the reasons that it's so miraculous is considering who you are, who you were apart from Christ. You are a rebel, an enemy of God, undeserving of that love, and unworthy of that love, unlovely, unlovable. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ in grace and mercy loved you, even you, right? Even me. So that's the, that's the feeling here that John has. I'm the one. He's amazed. He's amazed by it. I'm the one. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. Not that he loved John at the exclusion of the other disciples. But John here, not prideful, amazed and humbled by the Lord's love for someone like him. Now John here in verse 23 was sitting on the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember, around the U-shaped table, the low, the low table in the middle of the room, U-shaped, it's not the, the snapshot of the 12 disciples, uh, the Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> painting, where they're all sitting on one side of the table like they're posing for a picture, right? It's a low U-shaped table. They're reclining at the table, leaning on their left arm so that they can eat with their right. And John here, leaning on Jesus' bosom. It means that John was on his right side, incidentally a place of honor. John here sits at the place of honor. And as he's leaning on his right hand, he's leaning into the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 24. Simon Peter then, from across the table, right? Simon Peter motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Now, Peter actually shows a little restraint here. He doesn't blurt out, which Peter is accustomed to doing. Right? He's discreet about it. He wants to get an answer to his question, so he motions to John. Verse 25. Then leaning back, right? he's got his, hand, his right hand out, leans back closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said to him, Lord, who is it? Who is it? But they have absolutely no idea who it is at this point. Let that sink in for a moment, right? The degree to which hypocrisy can hide even among those closest to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even to the degree at which those men were laboring together day in and day out in the gospel. It's amazing, isn't it? Three years together, they're stumped. Jesus answers in verse 26, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread... He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. At this point in time, they don't have much Christian history to look back on, right? They've got no Christian history to look back on. Uh, this might not have surprised people in the church. This wouldn't have surprised Christians a few hundred years later. We, sadly, are used to seeing rank hypocrites rise up from among us, right? Doing all the right things, but completely devoid of the things of God. This shocked them, and they were stunned. What are some points that we should take away from this? What are some sheep that we can pin to our line, right? The first is this. There will be counterfeit Christians. There will be false professing Christians closely associated with the true people of God. That is going to be the case. The scriptures testify of it. They are the tares of this world masquerading in the church as wheat and infiltrating the church. The Lord says not to gather them and take them out of the world in Matthew 13, but we are certainly to deal with those that we find in the church. That's what church discipline is for, right? We're to deal with those in the church. This is going to be a reality. There will be counterfeit Christians, false professing Christians, closely, intimately associated with and closely, intimately working in and among the people of God. Paul warned in Acts chapter 20, verse 29, he warned of this. For I know this, that after my departure, Paul says, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men are going to rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, he says, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. That's why we take such time here appointing or admitting members. We understand that, right? That's why we take such time admitting members. That's why we take such time and go to such great lengths to appoint leaders. 
Paul has warned us. The scriptures warn us to do that quickly, right? To do that quickly in the church today shows no concern for the warning. To do that quickly shows no care or concern for the people, no care or concern for the church. We have to take our time. We have to be careful. And even being careful, look at the 12. They had no idea that Judas was a betrayer among them. There will be counterfeit Christians closely associated with the people of God. Secondly, it shows just how close the counterfeit can appear without actually being born again. It shows just how close, how carefully that hypocrite is counterfeited without actually being born again. Consider how Judas kept up the deceit Right? Kept up the front. Judas deceived himself, and he deceived the other disciples all the way up until the end. Now be warned from this reality. We can't substitute church activity for true gospel transformation. Right? We can't think that because you do all the right things, that your heart isn't far from him. Judas did the right things. This is a warning, isn't it, to you kids here who have grown up in mom and dad's house where mom and dad love the Lord. And yet for you, you not yet turn from your sin to put your faith and trust in Christ and the things of God are just absent from your heart. You can't claim the faith of your father. You can't claim the faith of your mother. You, yourself, must stand before God and give an account. Turn from your sin. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Love him, heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Cry out to God to be born again, to be made alive from the dead. For you adults here who have grown up, so to speak, in the church. How many testimonies have you heard like that, right? Where you've, you've grown up just going to church. It's all you know. Go to church. Go to church. Go to church. Every time the doors are open, you're going to church. You're among the people of God. You've grown up in that environment. And your understanding of being born again is that just, it's just the way that you've always been. You've just always been there. Listen, you must be born again. The gospel produces a change in your heart, a change in your life. You must be born again. The faith that you must that you profess must be genuinely your own. Faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You must be born again. Thirdly, it shows the heinousness hypocrisy. The heinousness of hypocrisy. One way in the private workings of Judas's own heart and another way around the disciples. Maybe there are some of you here. One way in the private workings of your own heart and another way in the public workings of the people of God. One way at home with your spouse and another way among the brothers. Another way, in the privacy of your own heart, in the sight of God. Hypocrisy isn't just the sin of the unbeliever, is it? The believer can suffer from hypocrisy when you repent of that sin. Not one way at home and one way at church, right? Not an angel at home and a devil abroad. Now, before you think to yourself, man, I sure hope my husband is listening to that. That is precisely the wrong response. It reveals more about your own heart than about your husband's. Turn with me. I want to give you an example of this. Turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And again, from the response here, we're looking at lessons to be learned from the response of the disciple. If you're thinking to yourself, man, I know somebody that really needs to hear that. 
That is precisely the wrong response. Look at Matthew chapter 26 and drop down to verse 20. Verse 20, when evening had come, the Lord Jesus Christ sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, he said, assuredly, right, truly, truly, I say to you, almost emphasizing that because it's so almost unbelievable, right? Almost unbelievable. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Look at verse 22 and look at their response. This particular point in time it says they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Now listen, that's the right response. When the Lord makes this stunning declaration, these are men who have followed the Lord. Right? You and I, we follow the Lord together. Many of us have been in this church together for years. Right? We serve the Lord together. But if the Lord Jesus Christ came and said, one of you is going to betray me, the right response, the wrong response is not to turn to what, well, I wonder which one of these guys is it? It's going to be. <laughs> Who is it? Which one of you guys is going to betray him? Right? The right response. The response of the Christian, the humble response, is to turn that inward and say, what am I doing? Is it me? What part do I play in this? They were exceedingly sorrowful. These are men who had lived with the Lord, were following the Lord, loved the Lord, serving with the Lord in the gospel. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? You know, it's short-lived, however, because not long they're back to arguing again. But this is the way that a Christian needs to respond to these realities. You know, that kind of humility puts a hedge around hypocrisy. What is it that I am doing? What contribution do I have in this? Time and time and time again, right, when you're, you're counseling someone, they don't see that they're the problem. They don't see that they're contributing to the problem. It's always that woman that you gave me, right? That woman, that, you, that man that you saddled me with, God. They don't see their part in the problem. Focus on yourself, right? How are you contributing to the problem? However, still in Matthew chapter 26, I want you to see the detestable heights to which hypocrisy will rise to defend itself. All of the other disciples ask the question, and so even in this context, the hypocrite has to ask the question too. Look at verse 23. Matthew 26, 23. He answered, the Lord answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. 24. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. All of this said in the hearing of Judas. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Verse 25. Then Judas, interesting that Matthew qualifies that as who was betraying him, a current present participle. Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? In the audacity, right? The 30 pieces of silver jangling around in Judas's pocket. And he responds and asks that question. Rabbi, is it I? The Lord said to him, you have said it. It's amazing, isn't it? The height to which hypocrisy will go to defend itself. If you find yourself in conflict, resolving conflict, and you are defensive, right? And you are arguing and you're escalating the conflict. You're behaving here like Judas. Let me give you a fourth lesson back in John 13. A fourth lesson that we should learn from the response of the disciples. Our response to Christ, think about this for a moment. Our response to Christ is what defines our fellowship together in the church. Our relationship to him, right? Our relationship to him is what defines our relationship to one another. It's what defines the church. What defines our group? If we consider what the church is and how the church is defined, what defines our group, so to speak, is shared commitment to Christ. Shared commitment to Christ. Our shared entry into his love under his lordship, our shared entry 
into the purpose and mission of the Godhead to evangelize the lost, our shared commitment to faith and obedience. Those things define the church. They define our group, our relationship to him. You see? That's the same way that it was for the disciples. It's their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that define their fellowship together. It's not music, and it's not the coffee. It's not even merely or only the fellowship that we have together, my fellowship with you, your fellowship with me. It's not going to be the temperature in the room. It's not going to be the color of the building. It's not going to be the programs for the kids. It's not going to be the fact that we have a young adults group or we've got rooms where the 82 babies are stuffed into. Not those things that unites us in fellowship. It's our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by virtue of our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are set apart to him, to one another, amongst one another. It's that relationship that defines the church. When people lose sight of that, right, when people lose sight of that, they become self-willed rather than Christ-willed. That's when problems start. Judas entered into this, his own agenda, his own self-willed motivations, his own desires. Judas disrupted that. His definition wasn't Christ-related as much as it was Judas-related, you see? That's why in the church together, for our church to be solid and biblical and healthy and thriving, it depends upon our relating to the Lord Jesus Christ together as we relate to him. We need to obey the Lord. We need to honor the Lord. As we obey, as we put our faith and trust in him, as we link arms together serving him in his purpose and mission, we are united in Christ to the degree that one of us does not do that and we become self-willed or we abandon that work, it hinders or interrupts or disrupts our fellowship in Christ, you see? why in the church we've seen so many, haven't we, right? So many that have betrayed the cause of Christ to go out and do their own thing. You're sitting across from the desk from them, right? Having an exit interview, so to speak. You're talking to them and I'm saying to them, listen, obey the Bible. Just obey the Bible. Our relationship together is to be our relationship to Christ. It's to be defined by that. The Lord has given us commandment now, love the Lord by obeying the Bible. I know it sounds hard. I know it's in circumstances you don't like right now. I know that you don't see necessarily light at the end of the tunnel. But listen, if you will just obey the Bible, it will end up for the good of God's people, for the good of the church, and for your good. But how many times do folks become self-willed, self-interested, self-indulgent, looking out only for themselves, and they just simply won't do what God calls them to do. You're saying, listen, I know this is hard, but you need to go, and you need to make that situation right with your brother. Go make that situation right with your sister. Go resolve that conflict, and they won't do it. There are consequences to that. There's blessings, right? Doesn't the Lord say that? Blessings to you if you do that. So that's what defines us, our relationship to Christ. We maintain that relationship to Christ and by virtue of that our relationship with one another by trusting and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in John chapter 13. In verse 26 Jesus answered they're wondering who it is. Jesus answered it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, to extend the offer of bread, right, for him to, to offer bread to Judas, it's an act of intimate fellowship. It's an act of love. Right? He's, to, to break bread together, to have table fellowship together, was a meaningful thing. It meant fidelity, it meant loyalty, commitment, familial closeness, familial relationship. So, it also then demonstrates the height of hypocrisy for Judas to sit there and accept the bread from his hand with the 30 pieces of silver in his pocket. You see? Knowing what he's about to do. Now, if you're here today, you come to this church week in and week out. Maybe you come to group. Maybe you go to fellowships on Sunday. You're interacting with the brothers and sisters. 
but you're here, you're amongst us. You are, as it were, accepting bread from our hand. Brothers and sisters here love you. I'm, I'm, many times, right? Many times, the brothers and sisters here provide for need. Maybe they provided for your needs. Maybe they've taken up a donation and helped you in a time of need. They've loved you in that way. They've called you. They've checked on you. Concerned about your spiritual well-being. And all along, you've got another agenda. Let me say to you, by virtue here of verse 26, that you don't have to go through with it. You don't have to persist in your sin and hypocrisy. You don't have to sit there week in and week out with this, this hatred in your heart for the Lord and for His Word and for His people and come here. One of two things. Don't come here. Or two, turn and repent and believe the gospel and trust Christ and love Him and serve Him. Judas here just keeps on accepting the love of Christ and all the while sealing his faith. Judas sat there when the woman broke the alabaster flask and poured the oil on Jesus' head and on his feet and anointed him. And Judas in his heart was thinking, what a waste, a waste of that. That could have been sold, that money given to the poor, right, revealing his heart. And then Judas is in the room with the disciples when the Lord Jesus Christ strips himself down, puts on the towel, kneels at his feet, and washes his feet. And Judas accepted that from the Lord. What grace, right? What mercy, what an act of love for even Judas' enemy. And Judas accepted that. And now Judas sits here at the table. And the Lord extends, not only extending the bread, literally, but extending the bread of life, figuratively. Right? The, the hand of fellowship extended to Judas. And Judas continues to accept it, steeled in his hypocrisy, and determined to betray him. Listen, you don't have to do it. You don't have to persist in this hypocrisy, persist in this sin. Cut it out. Stop where you're at. Love the Lord. Serve the Lord. Be earnest. Be genuine. Be true. Judas stayed on the path, continued with his plan. He didn't turn to Christ. He didn't submit to Christ from the heart. You know, this must have been virtually unbearable for Judas, right? For three years, being in such close proximity to the Lord and having to keep up the charade. It, it, it had to have been burdensome. It had, to, it had to have weighed on him, right? The guilt building over the years. And nevertheless, in verse 26, the taking of the bread from the Lord was the final straw. Look at verse 27. After the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. You know, behind all of this, we see the work of Satan. Now, Satan here doesn't trust this work to an underling. Satan himself sees to it. Satan is going to revel in it, as Satan does with all hypocrisy among the people of God. He's going to revel in it. Verse 28, but no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. The disciples simply never saw it coming. Let's take some lessons. Let's, let's learn some lessons from the action here of Judas. First one is this. Considering Judas now, good works can't save you. Good works cannot save you. Look at all the works that Judas did. He's with them, following him three years, the best so-called Christian testimony, the best so-called profession of faith. Did Judas make a profession of faith? Yes, he did. He backed it up with action. The best testimony, the best profession of faith. Judas professed faith in Christ. He just didn't possess true saving faith in Christ. The best of all that cannot save you Apart from the regenerating work of God's Spirit, you must be born again. Two, the best Christian teaching imaginable, right? The best preaching in the history of mankind, 
the best discipleship program on the planet, the best Christian example to follow, the best Christian brothers around you cannot save you apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit of God. You must be born again. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can. Now consider that. No one is able. No one can come to me, the Lord Jesus Christ says, unless the Father who sent me draws him. I can't say anything else about that. That is as clear as you can get, right? There's no commentary necessary. Understand the doctrine of God. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's what the text means. If you're wrestling with that in your mind right now, stop wrestling. That's what the Bible says. That's what it means. That's why we, right, or that's why the so-called church cannot manipulate or manufacture means in order to gain conversions. Just use the words that the Bible uses. That's why it's such a, a wicked counterfeit to do the whole walk and I'll say a prayer thing. That's, that's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere does Jesus Christ call you to say a prayer and mean it, if you mean it, right? That, that's what misplaced faith, right? You're putting faith in whether or not you meant a prayer when you said it. It's not the gospel, folks. That's not the response to the gospel. Use biblical terms. Preach the biblical gospel. You must repent, turn from your sin, and believe the gospel. Believe in Christ. Trust in him. The church today is manipulating and manufacturing all kinds of false means to, quote-unquote, generate conversions, or facilitating what they think are conversions. And church today, so-called church, has become a factory for false conversions. Thirdly, the empty professor, the hypocrite, is 100% culpable for his hypocrisy. Look at verse 27. After the piece of bread, Satan entered him. All right, Satan entered him. But then look at what Jesus said to him. What you do, do quickly. Judas is responsible. Judas is responsible. Judas is culpable. Judas is guilty. It's interesting from verse 27, though, is notice who is sovereign over sending him. The Lord Jesus Christ sends him out, dismisses him. He expels him. Matthew chapter 26, verse 24, says, The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Fourth, all of this happened in Judas' life gradually over time. This didn't take place overnight in an instant. All of this happened over time. And you get that inference from the text. Judas has been losing the battle in his heart day by day by day by day never repenting never going to the Lord for repentance and faith. He's been losing the battle in his heart by degrees over time and it all comes to a head in this act of betrayal. He takes the bread that's the final straw and Judas heads off into the dark. Eternal, eternal dark. Before the sun comes up, Judas will be in hell. All this happened by degrees over time. His heart became predisposed, if you will, for the influence and eventual possession of Satan. In John 11, right, he's griping about the woman breaking the alabaster flask and anointing the head and feet of Jesus. Uh, by the time we get to John 13, He's in great hypocrisy, accepting the washing of his feet, accepting the bread from the Lord's hand, all as a culmination of this departure over time, this apostasy over time. Reminds us, it's, it's so difficult to assess the true condition of someone's soul. The only ultimate proof, the only ultimate proof that you are fully and forever right with God is that you persevere in the faith to the end. He that perseveres to the end will be saved. Now you can have assurance of your salvation. You should have assurance of your salvation. But as you enjoy the blessings of that assurance, you must persevere in the faith to the end if you are to be saved. 
you're going to be tested. So pass the test. Persevere. Look at verse 30. Having received the piece of bread, Judas then went out immediately, and it was night. Literally night, figuratively night, spiritually night. He went into the night, into the dark night of eternity. Judas swallowed up in the darkness. Judas thought that he was selling out the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver, when Judas, in actuality, was selling his own soul for 30 pieces of silver. And so it is with all who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, it doesn't have to be that way for you. It doesn't have to be that way for you. The Lord freely offers love and grace and mercy and compassion and forgiveness. And he offers that to you this morning in the gospel. For you to sit here this morning and reject the Lord's gracious offer, you are playing Judas. Take the bread from his hand in earnestness, in truth. Turn from your sin. Put your faith in Christ and live. What a, a terrible tragedy for Judas. Don't continue to reject as Judas The way of the transgressor is hard, and then you die. If you maintain the hard heart of Judas, you'll receive the judgment of Judas. Turn now at the Lord's reproof, right? Look at how the Lord loves his own, loves them to the end. Look at how in his sovereignty, God cares for them through trials. God cares for them through difficulty. And then they have at the end of their faith this glorious inheritance reserved for us in heaven, uncorrupted, undefiled, which will not fade away. Blessings from the Lord to be lavished upon in such a way with that kind of love. What a glorious truth, a glorious blessing. Why, why would you persist in your sin and rebellion against God? Why would you not turn now at the Lord's reproof and be saved? provide for our sin, God. Make provision for the great debt that we owe because of our sin. That, Lord, in, in great, infinite, matchless, immeasurable love, your own Son sent into the world to die under the curse, to become a curse for us. God, by our wicked work, you Lord, sought after us. From heaven, you came and sought us. With your own blood, you bought us. We praise you, Lord, for all eternity. What a glorious blessing. I pray, God, that in light of these truths, in light of your sovereignty, your power, your omniscience, your omnipotence, your sovereignty over every difficulty, your sovereignty over every trial, every adversity, God, that we would fervently and faithfully serve you in the gospel as you've called us to do, that we would wage war against our sin, trusting you, depending upon the, the strength that your spirit supplies, depending upon you for the grace that we need to be victorious, to be overcomers, such that our faith becomes a victory that has overcome the world, all of which is a testimony of your grace to us in the gospel for your glory, God. I 
pray that you would strengthen us to that end. That you would cause us to live our lives upon these truths. That you would call to our remembrance your grace in the gospel, your grace in the Christian life. And in the face of whatever difficulty, whatever circumstance, Lord, that we would trust you, that would obey you, serve you, love you. I pray, Lord, too, that there's anyone here that isn't saved. it is to descend into darkness never to see light again never to see the light ever to suffer the torment of hell for all eternity God I pray for anyone who has made such a tragic decision I pray God you break their heart over their sin you would reveal to them the glory of Christ all that he is all that he's done they would turn from their sin and trust him alone and be saved. You, Lord, we know are the only one that can do that work. You are the one that doesn't draw them. You are the one that must give them life from the dead. You are the one that must cause them to be born again. You are the one that must grant repentance and faith. We cry out to you, God, to do that mighty work that only you can do. We trust you in it. Please, Lord, for your glory, for their good, save them. Thank you, Lord, for this church and the blessing of being united to you with each of your people. I pray, God, that we would keep our focus on you. Each one of us would consider, soberly consider, how we are related to you, how we serve you, how we obey you or disobey you. I pray, God, that you would convict us by your spirit, encourage us, Convict us, rebuke us, reprove us, strengthen us, mature us, so that we might persevere to the end and be saved. All for your glory, God, the testimony, the grace of God, and the gospel, transform our life. We love you. Thank you for this time.